This is a Digital Music Trends, episode 163, on the 26th of December 2013. Happy holidays, everyone, and hope you're having a great time wherever you are. I'm Andrea Leonelli, and this week the show is not the usual roundup of news. After all, there aren't a great deal of news to look at this week, but an in-depth interview with Jim Lucchese, the CEO of the music intelligence company, The Econest. I really hope this chat will be interesting both for those who never heard of The Econest before and for those who are already familiar with the company. To find out more about the show, visit digitalmusictrends.com or tweet us on at digimusictrends. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends and this week on the show we're going to have a feature uh, on the Econest and uh, with the company's CEO Jim Lucchese. So uh, hi Jim and great to have you on the show and thanks for joining me. How's it going? Yeah, great. Thanks for having me. So today we have a, a decent amount of ground uh, to cover on the show, uh, talking about the Econest. But uh, first of all, you know, I, I never want to give anything for granted on the show. So I just want to ask you, first of all, what is the Econest and what you guys do? Sure. Um, uh, we describe ourselves as a music intelligence company. We are essentially a data platform. Our goal is to really deeply understand music content and music fans and then put that in that understanding in the hands of our customers who are largely digital music services digital music applications so our goal is to help those applications better understand all the music out there in the world and each end user to facilitate better uh, online music experiences better music discovery more in-depth understanding of music more social and engaging applications Sure. And the company uh, started in 2005. And so uh, you joined at the very early stages. So how did you get involved and what was your initial role there? Sure. So um, the company was founded by Brian Whitman and Tristan Jahan. Both got their PhDs at MIT um, and both are music information retrieval scientists. And uh, Tristan's background is machine listening. So basically teaching computers to to hear music and understand psychoacoustic attributes. Um, and Brian's background is in cultural analysis. Uh, the thesis is if you can understand what everyone on the web is saying about music, you can understand all the cultural factors that go into kind of informing how we connect with music. And the founding vision of the company uh, that was unique is to combine the two. So there have been plenty of DSP companies out there, the cultural stuff in certain manifestations, but the idea of combining the two, um, you know, this, the Econist was kind of the first approach to doing that. Um, and their first investor uh, is was Barry Verico, who is uh, one of the co-founders of the MIT Media Lab. Uh, he invented CSound, the music programming language. And so Barry is, you know, he's an academic, he's not an investor, but he, uh, he was Brian's PhD advisor. He was excited enough about what they were trying to do that he gave him a little bit of money to start. And I knew Barry through Barry's son. So I played in a jazz quartet right. with Barry's son, uh, Scotty, uh, who also got his master's at MIT. That's how I met Barry, and he was like, you got to meet these guys. At the time, I was, uh, I was a lawyer, music lawyer in New York, doing digital media, digital music deals. Um, so you were at Greenberg, that, right? Yeah, I was at Greenberg Charlie. Um, and I did, uh, you know, artist side deals, um, you know, typical label deals, publishing deals, etc. but also did a lot of digital music deals as well. Sure. Um, and so Barry introduced me to Brian and Tristan while I was still at the firm. Uh, I did a little work for him at the firm, but I just got really into what they were doing. We got along really well and um, worked with them. We raised a little bit more money. I quit my day job and came over in, uh, in 07. Yeah, haven't looked back. So um, I want to ask you about you know, the, the beginnings. Of course, uh, the landscape in the digital music space was completely different in 2005. Yeah, and yeah. so I was wondering, like, were you already aware of the uh, commercial applications uh, of your products back then, where you were still essentially gathering the data and researching what your product was going to be? Uh, and has that panned out in the way you thought it would? Or uh, you know, ha has the company changed its course, its course a little bit over the years? Yeah, so uh, it's a good question. I, um, I'll... I'll, I'll I'll mention the thing that I think we, we definitely got right, but then also I'll mention one of the many things we got wrong. Um, we, from the onset, basically looked past the idea of downloads. At the time, essentially, yeah, downloads were pretty much it, that, and the idea of kind of uh, a viable commercial streaming market was, was not existent. Right. Um, but we viewed retail, uh, coming from the, the legal background, I viewed retail as something that existed more because it was easy to do, easier to do the deals 
because they looked a lot more like traditional retail deals did in the music space than where consumers really wanted to be. I think we all agreed on that. So we really built a platform that anticipated access to a large catalog via streaming and an ecosystem of applications on top of it. And that's why everything was so developer API centric really before there was an ecosystem of commercial parties out there. So we stayed very small for the first couple of years. We really focused on the platform, knowing that we were ahead of the market. Um, and we were like half a dozen guys building that. Yeah. Um, so I think that side of things, we bet early and bet right. Like at the time, people were saying, why don't you build like a retail recommender that sell, that basically can, can drive more download sales. And just wasn't interested in music as retail. We were looking, interested in music as digital media. Right. So I think that um, market bet, we, we got definitely right um, and helped to really inform the, the strategy that, you know, that, we're, that we've got today. Um, and then we've been pretty consistent there. Um, one, one aspect of that, that that we got wrong um, is that we anticipated that by this time, um, the API ecosystem for access to streaming content would be even more free and open than it is. So, right. so we did make the bet, um, you know, again, the kind of the lawyer and we made the bet that there would be a, you know, a smaller group of audio fulfillment players out there, very large ecosystem players who essentially have done all the deals with the content owners, but then they would have the ability to expose that content via APIs where third parties could come in and build commercial applications at top right. that content and that ecosystem. And that hasn't borne out yet. I mean, I think uh, Spotify's probably pushed things further than any other company in that regard. Um, but, you know, I, if you had talked to me in 2007, I would have said by um, probably 2010 that that world would exist and there would be this ecosystem of, of, of third party applications out there. And there is an ecosystem of third-party applications, but monetization of them is still a big challenge because of the underlying rights issues. So, so that's something I think we we um, um, we anticipated that's been certainly slower to market than than we originally thought. But the core idea that that music it would move to access um, that everyone would have access to essentially a limitless catalog and, and the data challenges that that would create, um, you know, that part I think we we, we got right. Yeah, exactly. And uh, uh, talking about how the company sort of uh, got to be known uh, around the world as uh, you know one of the reference points to get uh, that kind of data. Uh, you know, I, I was at the first Music Hack Day in two thousand and nine here in London, that's... and I think that's where I met Paul the first time. Paul Lemire, yeah. uh, who works at the company, and uh, you know, I was wondering how much has that uh, affected the uh, reputation of the company around the world in terms of you know getting developers to know how the api worked and those developers eventually ended up joining other companies and then probably evangelized about the service and, and that probably borne out some results in terms of business as well is that is that sort of does that sound about right it does it does and and um i i uh i can't take credit for that is something that we completely anticipated, or at least that I completely anticipated. We originally were centered around a developer API and ecosystem for a couple of reasons. One, we were anticipating the streaming world that didn't yet exist, and that made sense. Um, two, there are so many different things you can do with the platform, meaning um, from enabling remix applications to music discovery applications to social apps. There's just so many different things that you can do. Um, and then three, we didn't have a lot of money, so we weren't going to be able to do kind of enterprise software level integration. So, um, so we just put everything out in the open API and then pushed it to developers largely because, you know, the culture of the company is, is the, most of the guys here are application developers, Brian, Tristan, Paul, all of our early guys. And so um, they're part of that community anyway. Um, and early on, what happened was, you know, I think there was pent up demand. The Music Hack Days were a great example of this, a kind of the example of it. Um, people wanted to hack uh around music and we delivered uh, you know a, a great api to do so certainly last fm did we weren't the only ones sure. um but we are part of that community pretty early on and that community definitely built our brand so i think we we connected with application developers first before we connected to say 
C-level decision makers at many of our customers today. We were really developer-centric. Um, those developers would build cool things, blog about us, go to work at some of our you know, prospective customers. And that kind of took a grassroots approach to building our identity out there that's really grown. So Absolutely. it worked out. It exceeded you know, any of my expectations as far as um, what uh, our developer community would do for us. And it still does today. Sure. And uh, uh, on the company side, of course, uh, uh, you have a variety of products that uh, you offer as a company that people can access uh, different types of data sets depending on their uh, business. Of course, you're a B2B company. And so uh, I guess you started out with the music discovery and personalization products. Those were some of the key uh, first elements of the, yeah. of the Econest. Uh, and you've introduced uh, new elements uh, uh, over the you know, coming years. And uh, uh, for example, dynamic music data, music uh, audience understanding that we'll talk about in a little bit, and yeah. uh, audio fingerprinting that you introduced, uh, it was a couple of years back, right? Yeah. Cool. Uh, and so uh, how have you seen, uh, and also the interactive music and remix applications that you talked about too, which is, uh, again, uh, it takes advantage of some of the music analysis uh, uh, data that you pull from, from the, catalog, uh, the catalog you have. So how have you seen your customers relate to different products you offered? And uh, is there one that at the moment is still you know, strongest? Is it still the music discovery and personalization that which is driving uh, the core of the business at the moment for you guys? Yeah, it's a great question. So, so um, yeah, I think from a commercial standpoint, um, there are three primary areas, uh, music discovery, personalization, dynamic music data, and audience understanding. So right. on the discovery and personalization side, that is our kind of what put us on the map, um, personalized radio, um, DMCA compliant, uh, smart radio, um, music recommendation. Uh, and that is still the bulk of our, that represents the majority of our of our customer deals in one way or another. Um, and we still believe that we are in very early days there. So I think, you know, you'll see this year or in 2014, um, major investment on the product side and major enhancements to music discovery and personalization. I think the areas that are the most exciting to us is that really, if you think about say artist or song seed radio, um, they are ways, they are better ways than a straight broadcast, you know, format type um, uh, approach to saying, I like this kind of music, pick from one of 12 formats. So it's, it's, it's more fine grain, but it still requires a lot of explicit feedback from the user. Um, if you look at what we're doing, say, with RDO and, and U, UFM right now, the idea is that we should be good enough to be able to understand the situation that you're in, the context and ambient kind of attributes around you, to be able to play the right music at the right time without you ever having to take the phone out of your pocket. So Paul is leading up, Paul Lemier is leading up a lot of our no UI level personalization initiatives. And I think that there's, there's so much ground to cover there. So right. I think that you know, music discovery and personalization will remain, certainly remains a top product priority for us. And there's a lot more ground to cover. And so I think it will remain, you know, a top, top priority. Um, dynamic music data for us is really kind of an, it's a product offering we frankly kind of tripped over. I mean, we have lots of structured data about millions of artists, you know, tens of millions of songs. And a lot of our customers were coming to us and saying, we want something less static and kind of more dynamic web connected and providing additional data to, fill out an artist page or editorial type type services like uh, MTV or, or Yahoo music. And so that putting that together in a structured format kind of existed in the API and really the market came to us and said, we'd like this as a structured product. And, um, and now, you know, uh, dynamic music data is a very, very fast growing revenue stream for us because there is, you know, there's a great need for just editorial data about music across all of these various services Yep. And I think we offer something that's pretty easy to integrate and also pretty dynamic. It's always changing. Sure. Um, uh, and I, I think that from an R and D perspective, uh, there is probably, there's a bit less to do there than on the discovery and personalization side. Um, but it's certainly a meaningful part of our business. Um, and then lastly, audience understanding is, um, I think in earlier in a kind of market adoption, uh, in market need, but I think will become the defining kind of data challenge of this next kind of next phase of digital music. And that is 
understanding someone's musical identity in real depth. So understanding who you are as a music fan, who you are on a Monday morning versus who you are on a Friday night, yeah. um, who you are based on where you're, you know, your location, based on ambient factors around you, based on who you're with, and all of the things that can come from that. And I think taking a really in-depth analytical view as a market to understand consumers, um, you know, <laughs> it's, um, it's the internet, right? I mean, Absolutely. any, any business that, that is functioning well, ha- takes a really, really in depth. They take advantage of the fact that there's a two way conversation going on and that you can really understand your customers in depth. Yeah. I don't think that the digital music space is there yet. For no. the most part, I think phase one was, they got 20 million songs dumped on them and they were like, okay, how do we understand all this stuff to kind of organize it and put it in front of a consumer in a meaningful way. And we're rounding the corner now where there is some level of scale and adoption. Um, and people are focusing more and more on actually understanding who their customers are in, in depth. And I think that concept of musical identity, um, and really getting much, much smarter around understanding music fans and communicating that to them to improve both user experience and monetization is going to be a huge opportunity uh, or is a huge opportunity is, and it's going to be probably the greatest part of investment for, for a big part of the market. Sure. And that's what we're aiming towards. Sure, of course. And, and you introduced uh, this uh, music audience understanding uh, as an initiative uh, last month, uh, uh, yeah. which is, you know had some interesting points as well in the press release uh, that, was, uh, that came out, uh, talking about how uh, there's such an ingrained culture in uh, corporate spending on terrestrial radio right now still. You know, uh, we're talking about $15 billion per year spent on terrestrial radio advertising. And uh, you know, only a fraction of that goes into music streaming audio services, internet radio services. And that's maybe because advertisers are waiting to see the promise of the internet to deliver uh, to them in terms of like, really give them users in the palm of their hands that, you know, and making that super serve, super serving them in a way so that they can really trust and shift their budgets from terrestrial radio into into internet radio. So, uh, you know, do you feel like this kind of tool is what can tip the balance in driving revenue to companies that are looking to uh, they grab some of that, some of that uh, percentage of of, uh, of investment uh, done in or online. Uh, sorry, interested radio advertising. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I certainly think that um, uh, when you look at the the fifteen billion spent in terrestrial today and how that's going to move online, there are a number of factors in kind of driving. Um, how that spend is going to move over outside of us, for example, course, yeah. a lot of that's local. Um, there's just a huge cultural shift that needs to take place. But I think we are past the point where digital advertisers believe in streaming music consumption as a place to reach consumers. I think we're, we're past that as a um, kind of educating um, the buy side um, in, into the fact that that's a, you know, a viable medium going forward, number one. Number two is that uh, on the content owner side, if you look at the last year, um, the relationship between content owner and distribution partner, music service, the idea of a hybrid ad-supported subscription service, uh, you're seeing that more and more, not just in the U.S. or this compulsory license, but around the world. So most of these services, they are now digital ad- they are in the digital advertising business um, squarely. Um, so if you're in the digital advertising business, you better speak the same vocabulary as your competitive publishers who have a much richer, uh, often have a, you know, a, quite a rich way to package up their audience, provide analytics about their audiences, and, and delivering the value that you just mentioned to, to digital advertisers. Sure. And so, so I think as an industry, I don't think there's any question that to be competitive, um, as a di- in the di- as a digital publisher, deliver around around music that you've got to be able to communicate your audience in that really in depth way, and that's what audience music under- audience understanding is all about. Sure. It's about in a privacy friendly way analyzing music listeners in a way to map music list- anonymous music listening to high value audience segments for advertisers, and so I see I think that is a uh, you know going to be a huge need of for any of these players who want to be c- competitive in the space. Uh, I think there are lots of other factors outside of it. It's certainly not the only one. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it's, um, I, I think, I don't think it's a controversial point uh, 
to say that a, uh, a publisher, a, a, an ad supported music service is going to need to really be able to communicate who their audience is in great detail to advertisers if they expect to be competitive. Of course, and looking at it from, from, from a practical point of view as well, uh, I know there's lots, lots of startups that listen to the show as well. If there, if there, there were companies uh, that see this as being something that's compatible with what you're do, they're doing or something that they might need, uh, is this available through your API like some of the other products? Uh, or what is the best way of uh, getting in touch with you guys to, to yeah, get access to it? That's a good question. I mean, I think if you go to, if you go to our website under the Music Audience Understanding section, if you contact us... Um, We've got a couple guys who are just are dedicated to this to this product offering, and, and right. they'd be the point people. Um, uh, today, uh, it's not available in the public API. Sure. Um, you'll see that, but we are delivering data uh, to customers today, to customers and partners today. So, awesome. um, I think you'll see it. You know, often with us, what we'll do is when we announce something, um, we'll have the ability to to deliver. Uh, the capability, but it won't be available in the public open API, and usually that comes, you know, maybe a quarter later or so. The exactly. same deal here. Absolutely, that's great. And uh, finally, I want to talk about internationalization as well, uh, just because that's a big point. Uh, I, I see so many services now that are launching in yeah. uh, many, many different countries, and so that brings in the need to understand that catalog. I mean, of course, that, that doesn't mean that all those services have catalogs in those countries. That's something that they're still developing. I think you know, even services that you know are, are hoping to be international in scope, they still have a lot of ground to cover when it comes to licensing that catalog. But uh, as far as uh, providing uh, you know, a service for them, you know, for example, you mentioned audio, it's a partner that you work with. Uh, how hard is it to uh, get insight into that local catalog? And, uh, you know, how, what kind of strides are you making in the, in the, in the department? Yeah, so th um, this was something that we had talked publicly about when we raised money 18 months ago, it's something that we anticipated would be a, a big focus of the company going forward. And and back to that 20 million songs, it seemed like there was this race to get to 20 plus million licensed songs in the U.S. And then people saw wisely that um, there's a pretty big market out there and various services were looking at, you know, uh, territories where there was there were a number of factors that, that made for really interesting opportunities in streaming. Um, that would be basically the size of the music market, the kind of infrastructure around to support access-based models. Um, and some of our customers were, were pretty clear that that's where they were heading. Um, and so, you know, we knew that, that from a data standpoint, that would in every one of those territories introduce their own very, very unique challenges if you're going to deliver a great experience. And so we've been really heavily investing in, in localizing and globalizing the quality of our data. Um, uh, and uh, that some of the priority regions for us are Japan, India, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, Brazil, uh, Latin America generally, uh, all territories where we're seeing growth, where there are plenty of licensed catalog available and, and services pushing into those, whether they're pure play services uh, in the territory itself or yep. global players who are aggressively expanding in those territories. So we've got... Um, you know, edit regional ed editorial experts in all those territories. Uh, in some cases, we actually have independent data structures that we support uh, because just the underlying nature of, of, of the information around the catalogs are different. Right. Um, and we've been at that now for, you know, a year and a half plus. And it, I think we've made great strides. And I, I think I know that in, in many of those territories, you know, we've got, we've got great regionalized catalog. We maintain... Um, and a daily uh, analysis feeds of about 440 um, what we call regionalized local genres. So they are basically kind of regionalized catalogs that are changing all the time that we're kind of testing and checking, and that's grown pretty quickly. So I think we've, we've made great strides there, but, I mean, it's a never-ending and humble It's a world problem. of music, right? <laughs> Dude, it's, it's, uh, you, when you get into it, you just keep learning all the stuff you don't know. Yeah. And, and it makes you feel very small, very, very quickly. Um, India is one of my favorite to talk about just because it's just so mind blowingly complex and rich and, uh, enormous. And it's, uh, I think it's a beautiful job that will never be done. You know, you <laughs> will never be finished with it. And, and you hit the other interesting point. And then in some territories, um, the availability of licensed catalog isn't even really there yet. That's not the case right. in India. 
Um, but it, I think China is even more of an issue as far as local catalog, um, where, you know, we're, we're not as far along and I don't think anybody else is really yet. No. Um, but you know, it's, totally. it's something that's not going away and will be, will remain kind of a top priority for us. Um, where no matter how much progress you make, there's still so much work to do. Yeah, on, on a practical note, like on the international front, uh, how, how do you gather uh, the you know the basic data that you need in order to to analyze the music and the music itself? It, that, you know, do you forge relationships with the labels, or is, is it coming from digital distributors that operate locally? What, what, what is your approach? Um, our approach has primarily been through the kind of the, cert- the customers themselves. Right. Is the, is the lead because typically they not only have the kind of the source data, but they are also the strongest feedback loop as far as the overall editorial quality. You know, they usually have um, people whose job it is just to obsess about the user experience and the quality of what we're delivering. And so they are typically the best uh, players for us to go back and forth with. Um, and in many, in many of these territories, there are services that are getting there before there's any other aggregator or, or other service. Nokia is a great example. I mean, Nokia's content ingestion and content acquisition team was out in these territories before there were any aggregators to go talk to. They were the aggregator. They were actually encoding stuff. Yeah. Um, so there, you know, there's, there's no one kind of further ahead in those markets. Now, you know, when you look at some of these markets, there are, um, aggregators and other service providers who can be valuable partners to us and we're in a bunch of those conversations now in some of those other territories. So I think it's it's changing. Early on it was really focused on the services themselves. Um, but now it's 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 really a mix. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, one very last question that I, I just thought about uh, what you said earlier about um, APIs and accessibility. Uh, you know, we've seen this year has been really the year where uh, some companies have started looking at integrating different APIs uh, from different services in order to create one unique service where you can search for music, share music. Yeah. And we've seen you know, a project like Project Tomahawk, of course, or open source yeah. that is uh, gathering data from a bunch of different services and enabling people to uh, mm-hmm. cross communicate between what are uh, right now completely silos. Uh, environments essentially do yeah. you feel like uh, in 2014 we're going to see more opportunities for uh, cross-pollination and cross communication between uh, music streaming services so the users can uh, have the experience of sharing with a friend that has spotify and be on audio but still be able to communicate uh, music across well it's certainly something close to our hearts as you may know we've had uh, an id resolver id translation yeah. service called rosetta stone for years and what Rosetta does, for people who, do, who are familiar with it, is basically it translates um, ID sets across now about 40 or so various music um, data, data sets. So translating audio to Spotify. Basically, you can call with an Echonest ID or with your own native ID and get the, the appropriate song ID or artist ID for audio, Spotify, um, ticketing services, lyric sites. I mean, pretty much everything out there. Yeah. Um, and all of that is exactly to address the problem that, that you mentioned, which is real, true integration of various content uh, providers into a single application, and then also sharing among uh, consumers requires that level of kind of invisible translation to take place. And we believe we've solved that problem. Um, I would say going back to my kind of the other bet that we got wrong and that the market took a lot longer to get there, that's an area where uh, you know, we expected to see that two years ago. Um, I think we're starting to see more of it and you're starting to see far more elegant um, consumer facing kind of front end implementations of sharing across services. Exactly. So yeah, I think, I think uh, like Tomahawk's uh, Tomahawk's done uh, has anticipated that world. And I think, you know, among serious early adopters pretty much has that, you know, that locked up. And I think people are, are looking at making that even easier to do uh, across say large social networks so you'll see a lot more of it next year yeah, yeah. Stuff, yeah. and I, I had likened that in a blog post to to drm and how people hadn't really realized that it was a burden until they started wanting to switch services and yeah. we're seeing that you know the, the the first wave of consumers that are joining streaming services are still in their first year for the most part of being having been with a streaming service so they haven't really come across the problem if they want to switch from google play to audio or from audio to spotify yeah. of what happens to that metadata after that so i think when they come to that 
uh, bridge and they realize that they can't take it with them, then it, you're going to start to hear more noise, I think, from the user base as well to get those services in place. Yeah, I mean, I think there are two issues there. Issue number one is um, is, is the sharing kind of with, uh, among services and among yeah. consumers who, who have different sources of audio. The other point that you just raised, which I think is also going to increasingly become a huge opportunity, and that's portability of preference, where yeah. your musical identity is something, who owns your musical identity? Do you own it? Uh, does the service own it? Obviously, the service has a huge incentive in maintaining that uh, because it really protects the switching costs um, uh, and how, how portable you make that and your ability to plug that into other services is going to be something that's really, really interesting how that plays out. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Jim, for your time. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, you too. Thanks and a lot. Thanks, and thanks so much for listening to the Digital Music Trends uh, show. You can find all about it on digitalmusictrends.com or follow us on at Trends For the Econest, of course, you can go on econest.com and you can find all the information about the company there. They have a great blog, uh, which is uh, uh, just on uh, econest, uh, the blog.econest.com. And also, uh, you can find their editorial arm, uh, which is evolver.fm, uh, which is, of course, uh, run by Elliot Van Buskirk, who has been uh, on the show uh, several times. Uh, and so he's a, he's a really good friend, uh, friend of the show. Uh, thanks so much, Jim. Thanks a lot. And thanks for listening. And that's all for this week. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter.